Hi, David, and welcome to the WAMDA studio. Hi, Nadine. It's um, good to be here. It's good to have you. And uh, let's start with, so you interact on a daily basis with youth trying to express their ideas. Yeah, well, actually, that's one of the interesting challenges that we deal with in Lebanon is, is getting young people to think creatively about what is around them, what's in their community, in their school, et cetera, to come up with some of the stories that they want to write about. Even that is kind of an interesting challenge and process to go through. And, um, and a lot of fun as well. But getting people to think, you know, what is around them? What do they care about? What do they not like? What do they really like? What is strange? What is funny? What is interesting? As possible stories to cover. And what, 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 what have you noticed is like the most dominant thing that the youth, the young entrepreneurs in Lebanon like to talk about these oh, days? Really, there's a, there's a wide range of issues, but I think one of the um, most in, important and interesting things is that young people have a lot that they want to say if given the opportunity and um, told that, they, that their opinions, that their ideas are valued. I think that you know, one of the problems in the society and the school system um, and beyond that in work and in politics, etc., is that individual views are not particularly valued. Individual creativity, individual creative thinking. Um, schools don't have creative writing classes. They're not, they're not um, encouraged and supported to write creatively, to write independently um, about fiction or nonfiction even, even about um, papers and reports. You know, the idea of plagiarism is very dominant. The idea of memorization and regurgitation is very important, that your ideas are valued if you repeat as precisely as possible what your teacher told you. And um, uh, we need to figure ways to break out of that. And so offering them a venue and telling them that their ideas are valid and that we really encourage and support them in that process. And people are excited to, to write about stuff they see. So you're encouraging, uh, encouraging them to be innovati innovative, sure. uh, progressive, thinking on their own, independent, really. Yeah. So let me ask you, aside from the obvious, which is seed funding, what do entrepreneurs in Lebanon really need these days? You know, d depending on the idea, funding is really not the limiting factor right now. I think a much more limiting factor are really in engaging and supporting people to come up with these interesting ideas. I mean, we always, this is the, the common refrain is that funding is the thing that is holding entrepreneurs back. But if you're working on, a, you know, a web startup or, a, you know, even mobile phone or a lot of these different things, then you don't need much money. And I actually tell people that they should try to avoid investment as long as possible. There, there, there are difficulties that come with that, there are limitations that come with that. You're dealing with all sorts of other people, it makes you slower, it makes you more, uh, less flexible, etc. So you should try to bootstrap as, as far as long as possible before you try to get funding. Um, but you know, a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do, I think is addressing some of these challenges that we're seeing, that, that people are having difficulty coming up with the innovative ideas, with the world changing or competitive ideas because they're not supported, they're not encouraged to think independently and um, individually and creatively and critically, etc. So um, I think coming up with these good ideas and then really having the passion, I think that there's this crisis of the lazy entrepreneur mm. and at the same time the crisis of the lazy investor. That entrepreneurs, they think, hey, I'm going to go start a business um, and in you know, 12 to 18 months I'm going to sell it, I'm going to make a lot of money and, uh, and then I'm going to you know, live wealthy forever after. Well, that's the not a true entrepreneur then. That, exactly. Well. And, the, um, and people don't understand that you know, Twitter is around for five, six, eight years before they're turning a profit and that Google is around. These things take years to develop and build that kind of value. Mm -hmm. But the same, the, at the same time, there's that problem with the investors. The investors think, hey, I'm going to put in you know, twenty or $50,000 or $100,000 in something. I'm going to ignore it for a year or two years and then it's going to start giving me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my experience, you know, a lot of investors and, and maybe some of the best investors are people who were entrepreneurs and who did have that experience. And so when they put money into something, they put much more than money as well. They put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of themselves into it. That the, the investment process is, is, is a team effort, is a teamwork effort, and that they have to contribute in many more ways. Absolutely. So if you could wave your magic wand, what would you give the young entrepreneurs of Lebanon? Aside, well, from money. <laughs> Aside from money <laughs> and ideas. Well, look, you know, a lot of it depends on what field. And, and here in these kinds of events, that there's a lot of focus on tech innovation, web innovation, mobile innovation. But you know, right. there, there, there are many kinds of entrepreneurship, many flavors, many styles from 
um, agriculture, honey production, to uh, you know, light manufacturing, to furniture and design, to um, you know, graphic design, to you know, there's so many different flavors, and of course the, the web uh, entrepreneurs, the web innovators, and the mobile innovators, and, and tech innovators, all of this. So um, uh, really what I think that people need the most is the passion. They need the energy to go out and um, explore, find what is really interesting. What would, what would make them want to work on something for 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day and still call that fun? Mm -hmm. um, and on the weekends, if they really want to build something that is competitive in the world, that they're able to um, you know, compete, offer something to the world beyond their neighborhood, it's going to take a lot of time and energy, a lot of creativity, a lot of passion, a, a lot of self-learning. Uh, Nothing's going to be handed to them. And so uh, hopefully some people think of that So the best fun. advice is find something you love to do and get paid for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess of. so. I guess so. Don't well, even recognizing that the first couple of months or a year, you might not even be getting paid yes, for it. Yes. But you love it that but you much will enjoy and you're that much regardless. dedicated to it. Definitely. Yeah. So what was the defining moment for you um, that led you to create Hibber.me? Oh, geez. Well, you know, there, there were a lot of these things. I actually worked on two efforts to start a community media outlet uh, before starting Hibbard um, and working with people to start Hibbard. And both of those efforts, uh, we tried to do in a very open, collaborative way, uh, engaging lots of different groups, etc. And, and we, we had a lot of challenges with that. Um, uh, and then learning from those efforts and seeing what are some of the needs, some of the gaps in Lebanon and with the young people we worked with, et cetera, that we modified our approach um, to be able to adapt and, and start up Hibbert much more successfully. One of the key things is having the right team. When we were working on the efforts before, we had a, a great number of no, people. No, but I want the moment. It just oh, hit you moment. and you thought, okay, this is it. This is what I want to do. It makes sense. And you just jumped in and did it. Do you remember that moment? Uh, yeah, of course we did. Uh, I, of course I do. It, it, and it was a, a scary and uh, exciting and powerful moment. Um, we worked on this project at the, in the beginning of last year, and we, it was under a different name at the time called South of Shabab. And uh, we had about two months to do this crazy project to create a, a, a youth-powered alternative newspaper. And, um, and yeah. in the end, we... we this one. Yeah, here's the, this, is our, this is our 10th and 11th issues now. We've been doing it for about a year. Okay, guys. And, uh, f but for during that first effort, we were able to pull in, within those two months of working, six weeks of publicly doing outreach, engaging people, engage over young, 100 young people. Um, uh, we co-published with two of the main newspapers in Lebanon. So on the day we published, we had about 50,000 copies out. We were the highest distribution... Mm -hmm issue on that day and um, uh, that's longer than a moment that's a two-month moment but it took us from something that we thought was crazy and ridiculous and a dream to actually seeing it in print and having a whole bunch of young people thrilled and working on it and then we realized it was really at that moment that we realized that this could be real before that it was a little bit even fictitious in our minds mm -hmm. we were going on a on kind of blind faith of whether we could do this or not Okay. And it was that moment that it was demonstrated that we could. The aha moment. Okay. So let me ask you this. I mean, you've got a, a, a you know a site, an online uh, citizen uh, journalism site, and you're also publishing a paper. So obviously, you are not from uh, the school of thought that print journalism is dead, right? Certainly not. Okay. Why is that? Well, I mean, looking at the at the demographics of any market, of who your audience is, of how to engage people. Um, uh, you have to think very, in a very open-minded way about how to reach your group and engage uh, the people who you want to engage. Even in, you know, I grew up and otherwise spent time in, in Silicon Valley, and even in the heart of, you know, what people call the, you know, the mecca of innovation and technology, print is still very much alive. It's changing, it's evolving, and maybe over the next five, ten years with things like the iPad and with things like Kindle and uh, flexible screens and all of this stuff, uh, print will continue to decline, but uh, it's still very prominent. So how can we say that in the developing world, in Lebanon, where uh, internet penetration is much lower, where yeah. internet is much slower, I think inter internet where even when people like are online, yeah. yeah, and when even people are online, they're doing a much more limited range of stuff that print is not an effective way to reach people. The print is still very important to us. It's very dear to our heart. And it's a great way. It's very exciting for young people not to just, it's easy for anyone to go and put something online and then you say it's online. But when young people 
hear and know and that it's getting it. printed and they can see it and it's tangible. You can feel yeah, it exactly. and know that it's getting distributed to 25,000 people in the country. It's a really exciting way to motivate people. Certainly. Um, uh, we're just actually getting ready to launch a, a new website and we're looking at do, uh, increasing the ways of linking the online and the offline. Um, actually, really, we, we call ourselves, we say that we're a media outlet that works online, in print, and in person. Mm -hmm. And even the in-person stuff is very important. We trained over 500 people all around Lebanon last year um, on a whole variety of issues. And we organized different fun events and activities to connect with people, engage people. And, um, and I think that is really the future of media, of citizen media, et cetera, is having that kind of diverse methods of, ga uh, of ga engaging people. Um, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have that <clears throat> much time to chat, but one uh, last thing, word of advice for young entrepreneurs out there like yourself. What would you say to them today? Sure. Um, uh, I, think, I think really, the, the, if there's one word that I could say, it is passion. And having excitement for something, finding that thing that really um, drives you, that you wake up in the morning and you think about it. And when you're, when you're, uh, when you're not working, you have fun talking about it. When you, you, you're excited to learn more, um, something that kind of drives you. And a lot of people, they're not exposed to many different things to find what their passion is. And so, you know, I, I guess that would be my main suggestion is spend some time, explore some different things, do some different internships in different fields. Don't get stuck into one thing right away and think that there's nothing else out there in the world. You know, explore a little bit. And then when you find the thing that really does excite you, then, you know, go for it and uh, push it to the limit. Yep. It's all about the passion. Well, thank you so much, David Napti.